Good afternoon. Thank you so much, Dean Alexander. I'm so proud to be an alumna of Villanova Law, especially under your transformational leadership, expletive transformational, really. You've done so much since coming to the law school. And I'm pleased to be able to reconnect with the law school in a meaningful way by serving on the advisory board of the center. I applaud the many contributions of David and Connie Gerard de Carlo to Villanova Law, and particularly their inspired founding and stewardship of the Center for Ethics, Integrity, and Compliance. David and Connie were classmates today, or way back when, I won't say how long ago, with me at Villanova Law, so we go way back. We're very good friends. I'm only honored to be on their board, and I know they are on the live stream, so shout out to David and Connie and to the other members of the advisory board who are tuning in. I want to start by telling you a very old story about attorney ethics, which concerns one of the most famous lawyers who ever practiced, Cicero. In 80 BC, in the waning days of the Republican Rome, the dictator Sulla ruled over the city. With Sulla's backing, the tyrant's favorites contrived to divest many Romans of their land and their lives. In one such case, these greedy underlings went so far as to murder a simple farmer and then concoct a prosecution of the man's son and heir, Sextus, for patricide, so that they could take the farmer's land. The underlings hired a well-known and unscrupulous prosecutor, Gaius, to bring a baseless homicide case against the young Sextus, who struggled to find any lawyer who would defend him, for everyone was terrified of Sulla. But there was one lawyer, Cicero, who was then a mere 27 years old, who chose to take Sextus' case, despite the enormous personal risk to himself. In an epic defense speech to the jury at Sextus' trial, the text of which has survived complete, Cicero turned the case around, putting Gaius, his masters, and by implication the dictator himself, on trial. Sextus was acquitted, and Cicero was forced to flee Sulla's wrath. I believe that Cicero took and won this dangerous case because, unlike Gaius, he remembered the oath he had taken, an oath sworn by all Roman lawyers to, and I quote, only speak that which he believed to be true, end quote. Clothed in the righteousness of his oath, Cicero was able to convince the jurors to remember their oaths to judge the case only by the strength or weakness of the testimony rather than a desire to uh, have favor or avoid fear. The dictatorship of Sulla was fleeting, and no one remembers Gaius, the corrupt prosecutor, but Cicero's act of integrity not only launched his brilliant career as a statesman and philosopher, but echoes down to all lawyers in the present day. Only speak that to which you believe to be true. Indeed, the old Roman oath stands at the forefront of a long tradition in our ancient profession, which, alongside medicine and ministry, is founded on principles of integrity and ethics. Just as Rome's advocates took an oath to avoid artifice and circumlocution, and as I noted, only to speak that which he believed to be true, to refrain from injurious language or malicious declamations against his adversary, and to refrain from the use of any trick or prolong the cause. So too did advocates in the 13th century ecclesiastical courts of England take a similar oath, St. Paul's oath. These English advocates, like their earlier Roman counterparts, promised to, and I quote, plead faithfully, not to delay justice or to deprive the other party of it, but to defend his client both according to law and reason. The tradition of oath-taking carries on today, for we also take an oath upon our admission to the bars. These oaths should serve as a constant reminder of our crucial responsibility, our ethical responsibility as officers of the court. To practice before the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit, for example, a sponsoring member of the bar must move for the admission of the new member and certify that he or she possess the necessary qualifications and that his or her private and professional character is good. The new member must, in turn, 
solemnly swear to conduct himself or herself as attorneys and counselors of the court uprightly and according to the law. And upon admission to the practice of law in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, we swear to discharge our duties as attorneys with fidelity as to the court as well as to the client, to use no falsehood nor delay the cause of any person for lucre or malice. Although the oaths sworn across cultures and time have been articulated in different ways, they demonstrate how the advocates were, as we are today, unified by a fundamental dedication to the concepts of fairness, competence, loyalty, confidentiality, reasonableness, and public service. As the 1908 version of the Canons of Professional Ethics explained, we lawyers have a broad and serious responsibility to avoid disloyalty to the law whose ministers we are. And yet, notwithstanding our centuries of oath-taking and stated commitment to integrity and ethics, it is remarkable how little was done to formalize and define these principles in our American system of ad advocacy until relatively recently. Between the signing of the Declaration of Independence and the election of William Howard Taft, a period of over 130 years, there was no concerted effort to codify any uniform rules for the profession. Indeed, the ABA's 1908 Canon of Ethics represented the first effort to codify some universal rules of the road. And even then, it was another 66 years, and not until we were swimming in the wake of Watergate, that the ABA would require law schools to provide its students with instruction in the duties and responsibilities of the legal profession. That lawyers were so late in the, to the code of conduct game compared to, for example, physicians who adopted a code a half a century earlier has many reasons. But I submit that our movement away from localized professional discipline, which was common here in the United States throughout most of the 19th century, systems in which local court and local lawyers might excoriate a colleague who stepped out of line in the way the English inns of court discipline their barristers. Moving towards a formal system of codes and disciplinary bodies, it parallels similar changes in the practice of law. I've observed these changes myself in practicing law and my time on the bench. I joined Duane Morris and Heckscher, now Duane Morris, in 1973, the year before the ABA required the formal teaching of ethics in law school. Duane Morris was a firm founded on Quaker principles, the firm leaders were pillars of the community, leaders of their churches active in community affairs. We had clients whom we represented for decades, U.S. Steel, Swarthmore College, Urban Engineers, to name a few. The firm published a book upon its 100th anniversary in 2004 with a chairman's message that began. It stated, looking back on the century, quote, how we practice law and the business of the practice of law have changed dramatically, particularly in the last decade. However, the ethics and values of our 100-year heritage are as relevant today as they were at the birth of the firm. It is this heritage that has contributed more than any other factor to Duane Morris's success. How fortunate I was to spend my 21-year legal career with that heritage as my guidepost. And I was even more fortunate to have as my mentor and amazing man, David Sykes, who was perhaps the most ethical lawyer I ever met. He and I started the firm's bankruptcy practice in an area when bankruptcy was to be avoided and was closely associated with backroom dealings. But all that changed with the passage of the Bankruptcy Code in 1978, which transformed bankruptcy into a legitimate business strategy. His guidance was so important to me. So today, I want to take the opportunity to play that role as mentor and impart some lessons learned, primarily to our students and young lawyers here who have their entire professional lives in front of them with all the challenges they will face. You young law students and lawyers are embarking upon the path of this profession, but in a different era, an era where money talks, where law firms compete for the business of clients who, when I was a young lawyer, 
were loyal to the firm who represented them. An era in which, for you to get ahead, you need to prove your worth day in and day out to the client and to your colleagues. Gone are the days of client loyalty. Now, law firm milieu may be different from social service or government work, but even there, the desire to succeed, win, or get ahead will present challenges, as I will note later on. So, we should conclude, ethics is old-fashioned, really has little relevance in the area of social media, 24-7 news reporting, high-stakes legal maneuvering, and formal codes of ethics that set out bare minimum meets and bounds of behavior, right? Au contraire. Don't think of ethics as something out there in the profession or simply rules in a code of conduct. It is as near to you as the nose on your face. I have come to call it the look-in-the-mirror test. Do you like what you see? Are you standing quite as tall today, having crossed the line and been overzealous in representing your client yesterday? Thus, my topic today is ethical reflections. Whatever you did yesterday is part of who you are today. You can't erase or, re or undo it. I want to share with you two stories. My son left Penn after his junior year to tour with his rock band. Don't look down. You can Google it, not now, later. You can Google it. Rock band, don't look down. And the YouTube album, Undone, comes up complete with a picture of Jesse. Well, he hadn't really taken that much advantage of what Penn had to offer, spending much of his time practicing with the band in New Jersey. At the time, I wasn't sure that his leaving Penn to go on tour was a good idea. But looking back, it was a turning point in his life. And I concluded I didn't want him to live a life of regret. So off he went. While on tour, he wrote a song with the theme and the lyrics, the things you do determine who you are. It was about one of his band members doing things that were uncharacteristic and would, Jesse thought, come back to haunt him. I asked him where that lyric came from. And he said, Mom, don't you remember saying that to me time and again when a group of us would be going out on a Friday night and possibly drinking beer underage and possibly get caught? You'd tell me, you know, when you do something and you later regret it, it's too late. It's part of you. It is who you are. You can't undo it. You will have to live with it. P.S. He went back and finished Penn two years later acing his courses and graduating cum laude. And he's a fine, upstanding citizen today, I might add. <laughs> that was an ad lib. I had a similar experience when practicing law, representing a man who was managing his elderly mother's apartment complex. Let's call him John. <clears throat> he, was a mean, he was mean and disrespectful towards his mother. Not a good sign to begin. And he turned out to be a difficult client. I never... I never knew whether to believe what he told me, and he'd get very angry when I questioned him. He had defaulted on three mortgages on the property, and we filed a Chapter 11 petition to keep the banks at bay. The three banks were represented by three local lawyers whom I knew and respected. John had made representations that I later suspected were more false than true. There came a time when I was asked by him to take a certain position in the Chapter 11 proceeding, and I realized that my reputation among my peers, these three lawyers especially, to say nothing of the judge, would suffer greatly if I continued to do John's bidding. So I told him I couldn't represent him any longer. He was not pleased and said things that made me really glad that I had, represented, had ended the representation. I've often thought that I was fortunate that I ended the representation, and I was fortunate to have followed my instinct my gut, before crossing the line, from which there would have been no going back. I realized that the respect of my peers is the measure of my success. Mutual respect is our stock in trade. The fact that other attorneys would speak less of me, let alone that my look in the mirror session would not go so well, was huge. The words of Pennsylvania Chief Justice George Shardswood from the mid-19th century remain true today, and he wrote, a very great part of a man's comfort, as well as his success at the bar, 
depends upon his relations with his professional brethren. With them, he is in daily necessary intercourse, and he must have their respect and confidence if he wishes to sail along in smooth waters. Which brings me to mention another lawyer who was an influence in my life, Lou Gold. Lou passed away in 2020, but one of his clients thought so much of Lou that upon Lou's retirement in 2018, he presented Lou with a gift of $20,000 to be made to an educational institution of Lou's choosing. Lou passed away before designating it, but his wife, Karen, and his two daughters, Sarah and Judith, chose this lecture series at Villanova Law, Lou's alma mater, because it would not only be meaningful to Lou, but also would be a fitting tribute to the high standards of ethics and moral principles by which he led his life and how he practiced law. Upon hearing of Lou's death, numerous attorneys wrote to Karen and to Lou's brother Mark and told them of their fondness and respect for Lou. They mentioned repeatedly his qualities of integrity and ethics, and I quote, He was a role model of professionalism. He showed respect for the legal process and opposing counsel. He would do what was right while zealously representing his clients. End quote. I practiced law with, but mainly against, Lou. His law firm, Edelman Levine, Gold and Levin, represented businesses and sometimes debtors in bankruptcy proceedings, and my firm usually represented creditors. John, the client I referred to earlier, was an exception. Representing debtors down on their luck was very challenging from an ethical standpoint. Many were in trouble for reasons of their own making and had every incentive to play fast and loose with their creditors and with the court. But when Lou Gold was on the other side representing the debtor, I could always trust him to guide his client appropriately and speak only the truth. As one of the other lawyers who was in our professional circle recently noted to me, Lou always had good judgment. He was reasonable, he advised his clients about the law, but didn't go to extremes. Ethics was embedded in every fiber of his professional being. There might be a gold standard, pun, (laughs) but Lou was platinum. The qualities of ethics and integrity not only serve you well while you're in practice, but they live after you as part of your legacy. It is an honor to be giving this inaugural lecture to pay tribute to Lou's legacy. And I want to introduce those who are here today. Lou has many family members, but his widow, Karen, is here. Karen and daughters, uh, Sarah and Judith, and we thank you so much for your participation. His brother, Mark, and sister, Harriet, are also with us. So would you stand and we can say thank you. The temptation to cut corners or play fast and loose with opposing counsel will be there for you. Presented by colleagues, supervisors, clients, just the devil inside you or the almighty dollar. And at those times you'll feel alone. It will be just you and your moral compass and perhaps a trusted friend or mentor to whom you can turn. And you should seek out the advice of others if confronted with a perplexing situation for reasonable minds can differ as to how to handle it. I recently read an article in which the following scenario was the subject of debate among ethical scholars. A couple living in Virginia are getting a divorce and have come to agree on the terms of a property settlement which has been reduced to writing. The husband's attorney approaches the wife's attorney suggesting they discuss alimony. The wife's attorney says, let's just get this signed and then we can deal with it. The husband's attorney knows that in Virginia, if alimony is not included in a property settlement, it is waived. What should the husband's attorney do? Well, there was ultimately a prevailing view that the husband's attorney should get permission from his client to tell the wife's attorney of the ramifications of not including alimony in the property settlement and lacking that permission, withdraw from the representation. But the discussion about what to do among these legal scholars took up nearly 20 pages. These are not easy issues. Nothing that involves an ethical, moral dilemma ever is. The concept of morals comes up repeatedly when we think of a lawyer's duty. Clement Hainsworth, 
former chief judge of the First Circuit, commented, the lawyer must never forget that he is the master. He is not there to do the client's bidding. It is for the lawyer to decide what is morally and legally right. And as a professional, he cannot give in to a client's attempt to persuade him to take some other stand. Just as a physician may not prescribe a narcotic for a patient simply because the patient wants it, the lawyer must serve the client's legal needs as the lawyer sees them, not as the client sees them. What a weighty responsibility at one, and one that you at your peril could perhaps unwittingly shirk. It amazes me that in the course of the profession, we see examples, some notorious, of questionable behavior, behavior demonstrating a lack in ethics. These examples lead us to say, what were they thinking? To which we might answer, well, they weren't thinking, or they didn't look closely enough in the mirror. They were alone with their moral compass and just didn't listen. I venture to say that the more successful you are in the practice of law, the more careful you need to be, and the more tempting it is to pursue winning at all costs. The look in the mirror test then needs to be a good, long, hard, frequent look. Take the example of the former Pennsylvania Attorney General's Office prosecutor, Frank Fina. He was at the center of some of the region's biggest criminal trials, from bonus gate, computer gate corruption scandals that led to the arrest of more than 30 politicians and staffers, to the conviction of Jerry Sandusky, the notorious child predator and former Penn State University football team's defensive coordinator. One lawyer who knew him early in his career in the Harrisburg DA's office said that he had a sense of balance and was not trying to accomplish anything other than what he believed the law requires. Much later in his career, a defense lawyer described him differently, quote, if he thinks you're going to punch him in the face, he's going to punch you five times in the face, end quote. In 2015, FINA came under scrutiny for circulating what some described as disgusting porn emails in the attorney general's office at the same time as the office was investigating the Sandusky scandal prompting Robert Davis, a lawyer and teacher of law school professional ethics, to comment that the, quote, arrogance is stunning, end quote. At some point in your life, the situation presents itself, and the thought goes through your head. This could make my career or break my career. You have to stand tall. Well, FINA apparently missed that advice, and in 2020, the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania suspended FINA from the practice of law for a year and a day for what the disciplinary board called, quote, reprehensible and inexcusable questioning of counsel for three Penn State employees about conversation that she, the counsel, had with those employees whom she represented after he had represented to the supervising judge that no such questioning would take place during her grand jury appearance. And I'm just reporting what has been reported in the disciplinary board proceedings. What was he thinking? And recently, what were lawyers thinking in filing suit to overturn the election when they actually produced no evidence of voter fraud, let alone widespread fraud? And I'm not editorializing. This is in the case law. How do these things pass the look in the mirror test? Does ego mask the truth? It's been said that Ego is about who's right, but truth is about what's right. Integrity and candor with the court are essential. I had a case before me when I was a district court judge, and I was pushing counsel to trial. One of the attorneys, a very well-respected trial attorney, who was representing the defendant corporation, wasn't happy with that. And although the case had been before me for over a year, suddenly decided to object to my continued handling of the case because of purported conflict based upon his firm's previous representation in the city in a litigating matter when Ed Rendell was mayor. This was not something new. The conflict was questionable. But I did what I learned to do in even questionable situations, when in doubt, recuse. And I recused. The case went to another judge with no trial date in sight. 
Surely it was a permissible move on his part to represent his client zealously, but to this day, when I encounter this attorney, even socially, I can't help but think a little less of him. I wonder if he senses that. Do you want to be that attorney? Just as losing respect among your peers based on even one seemingly insignificant incident will stay with you, so too will losing respect of the court stay with you. It cannot be undone, and your reputation with that judge will be damaged forever. Your client may be pleased with your zealous representation, but I suggest that displeasing the judge should be the weightier consideration. There's been recent debate about the need for or desirability of the concept of zealous advocacy that appears in the preamble and the comment to the Pennsylvania Rules of Professional Conduct. It doesn't appear in the rules themselves. The question arises, is the comment stating the, that the attorney's obligation is to act with zeal on the client's behalf inconsistent with the rule which requires that the lawyer act with, quote, reasonable diligence, end quote. More troubling is the idea that the Z word is misused as a basis to justify uncivil, even unethical behavior. As one commentator notes, attorneys who employ scorched earth tactics use their obligation to represent their client zealously as the shield upon which their defense is based. And one Third Circuit District Court judge suggested that zealous advocacy is the buzzword, which is squeezing decency and civility out of the law profession. I suggest that reasonable diligence, decency, and civility should be the aspirational guides for your representation. Leave zeal to the zealots. When it comes down to it, it's all about those dark moments of temptation and judgment. What are your considerations in exercising judgment? Do you ask yourself, what is the right thing to do? Or what can I get away with? Or what will be perceived by others as success? There is a reason for the adage, to thine own self be true. Doing the right thing has its rewards. As one author put it, quote, the lawyer will find that not only his peace of mind and self-respect, but his ultimate well-being will best be served by subordinating what seems to be his temporary personal advantage to his cardinal loyalties, end quote. In my view, Although we now have formal canons of ethics and professional responsibility, disciplinary hearings, disciplinary committees, things which rightly arose in response to the political and social turmoil of the 60s and 70s to keep us in line, I submit that compliance with formal canons and rules alone do not make for a good life as a lawyer. Instead, we should strive, as Lou Gold did, not simply to comply with those canons or rules but to be true to our oath, to live and practice the law ethically and with integrity, thus giving real meaning to those oaths. Doing this will make all the difference in what you see when you look in the mirror and you are confronted with your ethical reflection. I do hope you will take it upon yourselves to do this and that you will consistently be pleased with what you see. Thank you. We have some time. If there are questions, I'd be pleased to on this subject, or I always open it up to whatever. Inquiring minds. Yes. We have a microphone coming around. Oh, oh I, I didn't realize the microphone would be here, but okay, we'll just go like this. Perfect. Um, hello, Judge Rendell. My name's Gabby Lipschitz. I'm a 3L here at Villanova. Um, just touching on the important lesson you provided to your son and his friends about how our actions and words ultimately do become a part of us each and every day. I'm wondering um, your opinion on cancel culture and how social media has started to provide this kind of um, archive of years worth of, you know, comments 
um, behavior that individuals might have either forgotten about or just got lost through time? And ultimately, do you think there is a place in ethics for second chances? For oh, second chance, yeah. yeah. Uh, that's interesting. Um, I must say, and this is off the top of my head, when there were the Kavanaugh um, confirmation hearings and what he had done in, in college, it reminded me when I went to fill out my form to uh, hopefully be nominated as a judge, uh, they went back and they interviewed people who purportedly lived next to me when I was in law school, you know, in the garden apartment in Arlington, Virginia. And, uh, you know, I didn't even barely remember where I, where I did live, and they scouted that out. I had to find names of people. It was really crazy because it was many, many years before. Um, and then at the end of the questionnaire, the last question is, is there anything else that we haven't touched upon? Of course, they touched upon everything imaginable. Is there anything else we haven't touched upon that if it came to light would be an embarrassment to the president? Well, oh my goodness gracious. I think I got stopped for speeding in Valley Forge Park one time after we had taken some clients to dinner and maybe I had two glasses of wine. I have no idea. But, you know, you do, everything is there. Uh, and now even more than, you know, when I adv advised my son of that, it was the fact that, you know, if he did this in Avalon, New Jersey and the, the cops got it, it would be on his record or something, you know, that would be at least an official record. Now everything's an official record. Uh, I mean, everything is, you know, somebody, he said, she said this. It's, it's, it's confounding. I'm so glad I'm old. <laughs> and if they haven't found it about me yet, they're not going to because it isn't there. Um, I do think it's scary. I think it's very scary because everything is, is so open and things that you think of had, that have no consequence do have consequence because somebody's going to say it looks like this or someone else could say it looks like... I think it's very scary. And I think there is a huge place for second chances. There is a huge place. But will, will anybody let anybody have a, a second chance? Um, you know, I'm not speaking as a judge now. I'm just speaking as, you know, kind of common sense person. But uh, I think it is is perplexing. Now you say cancel culture. I'm not even sure what that is. I, I'm that old that I really don't know what cancel culture is. But, uh, but I think it is, and I think we need to tell our children the things you do determine who you are and you do things and it's going to be there forever. You know, the use of phones and texts and everything, that, uh, you know, people behaving badly. It can come back to haunt you. Uh, and I think it's very dangerous also because I, I want people to be public servants. I want people to run for office and be active. And if every everything that you ever did uh, comes to light, you know, above the centerfold of the, of the newspaper as, you know, you're not a good person because you did this, I think it's very dangerous. And I fear that people won't want to put their lives out there um, to be, you know, judges or, or public servants, uh, you know, run for office uh, because uh, everything's going to come back to haunt you. Uh, they scout out the people you used to work for, and were you nice? Were you not nice? Uh, I think it's I think it's dangerous. So, uh, but I don't know what we do about it. That's for your generation to fix it. <laughs> Thank you. Judge, um, I'm Karen Eisner Zucker. I am a magisterial district judge great. here in Montgomery County. Good. Um, I see a great many pro se litigants. And one of the things that I've often observed is that conventional notions of fairness do not always comport with what is proper under the law. I know that civics is near and dear to your heart, as it is mine as well, and I wonder if um, you could speak to the lack of civic education and the damage that perhaps is being done because of that uh, with respect to um, knowledge about the law and how our system of government works and our judicial system works. I didn't plant that. I really didn't plant that. <laughs> But how long do we have? Um, no, there, it's probably been 50 years now um, that we really haven't focused on civics in schools. I mean, when I went to school, every grade I had almost looked like a catechism. 
Uh, you know, and you memorized it, the three branches, you know, checks and balances, but, but you knew it. Uh, and, and you knew you know, how old you had to be to be president, and you knew all these things, because these were in the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, you knew about freedom of speech, what the First Amendment was, but we don't teach that anymore. And uh, I just fear that that appreciation, uh, I'll tell you a story, uh, Justice Souter told a story of a Russian lawyer coming to visit the Supreme Court, and he wanted a tour, I, maybe many of you have heard this, but... Uh, one of the tour around, and Justice Souter volunteered to take him around, and as they were going around, it was obvious that the lawyer knew a lot about the Supreme Court opinions. And Justice Souter said, how did this happen? He said, well, during the Cold War, when one of my other lawyer friends uh, would get one of these opinions, we would meet clandestinely and discuss it. Uh, and the, the Russian lawyer asked Justice Souter what he thought was the most important uh, opinion of the modern Supreme Court, and he said, Brown versus Board of Education, which I think many of us would. You could tell the Russian lawyer was not happy with this, and he said, well, what do you think? And the lawyer said, the Nixon tapes decision. Because in my country, the thought that the president of the country could be told what to do by the court is unheard of. And Justice Souter said at that moment he had an epiphany. He said, we don't teach our children civics. We don't teach our children about the amazing government that we have how it works, how it works so well um, with the balances. Uh, and at that moment, actually, it was when uh, Ed was going to be governor, and I kind of said to myself, that's what, I, that's what I'm going to do. Um, and we really, you know, I do um, naturalization ceremonies. I look out a crowd of people like this with the joy on their face because they appreciate what our form of government is and how amazing it is. And they appreciate that the consistency and the predictability of our laws contributes to our economic advantage. And, the, and the, our Constitution talk, you know, gives rise to the opportunity that people have, you know, and the equality and liberty. Um, and it's just not appreciated here. And so people don't vote. People think that politics is what, the same as government, which it isn't. Um, and we have this very negative perception, whereas if people were educated, and I, um, I think uh, uh, Lou Gold's uh, grandson came to my courtroom, right, and did a mock trial uh, uh, from, uh, from Pearl, Pearl, Pearlman Jewish Day School when in fourth or fifth grade, they come and they do mock trials, they learn about the justice system, we have juries, the kids are on the juries, and I say, who's the most important person in this room? And they say, the judge, and I say, no, I said, it's the juries. And I take the juries out, and, I, and they use common sense. And I say, they're going to go to do jury service later. They're going to tell their parents, go to do jury service. Don't try to get out of it. It's very important. Um, and so, and my theory is if we teach them when they're young, then they'll realize what our government's about. But, uh, but it's, I have spoken to so many uh, superintendents who have said to me, there's no time. There's no time because everything's packed in and they have standardized tests and they can't vary. And I said, well, can we, can we make time? Can we kind of just kind of move it a little bit? But a lot of it, education's tough. I don't begin to think that, that it's easy. It isn't. Uh, and changing education, I think, has to be very difficult. But, but I think we've got to find a way. We've got to find a way to do this. We, uh, the judges of the Eastern District of Pennsylvania uh, just finished uh, an eight-week uh, one night a week uh, adult civic education course at community college. It's our third year of doing it. Every year a judge comes and speaks on a different issue. And we have adult adults who are zooming in uh, to, to learn. I think we had, I had 45 or so that we just, we just finished the last session. Um, but they're hungry for the knowledge. Uh, and they keep coming back and, and wanting more. We've got to do it when they're young. We've got to make it as important as math and STEM. I mean, it really, because it, we're developing citizens. We're, we're developing people who know math, engineering, all that's wonderful, but they're going to be citizens. So, yeah, I, I'm not sure what we can do in the schools. We, there are, interestingly, there were bills introduced in Congress last year to increase a lot of funding for teacher education and for nonprofit grants for nonprofits working in the area of civics education. And I think part of it is because we suddenly realize we realize we need it. Uh, and I think a lot of events of the, of the last few years, we realize we don't understand how the system works. We realize we don't understand what judges do. Uh, we realize it's not the executive to pass laws. And I'm not saying, and our executives, our presidents have been 
doing executive orders for, for ages, so this is not something new. But our laws are now being made by the executive. People don't realize that. The agencies and the president sets forth a lot of the laws, and the legislature, I'm sure they pass laws. I haven't heard of many that have been passed recently, but <clears throat> this isn't the way it should be. So anyway, for, for another day. Sorry for the long answer. Uh, okay. Yes. Okay. Hello, Judge. Uh, my name is Juan Dawson. I am a 3L here at Villanova Law. Thank you for being with us today. It's quite Thank a treat. You for my question pertains to January 6th, 2021. It was a pretty dark day in our country's history. Uh, and you've kind of touched on this, but since we have seen a lot of lawyers file mini suits that haven't produced uh, the results that some may have hoped that they would produce, can you speak on your views of the roles uh, of a lawyer and attorney in our democracy and perhaps the role that lawyers can play to protect and further advance our democracy? Well, um, you know, and it's not so much about January 6th, it's just generally. Lawyers have the responsibility when they file a complaint to have reasonable basis. You know, there are rule, rule 11, there's, there's rule professional conduct, and rule civil procedure that require you to have a base and not file a frivolous lawsuit. And you could be sanctioned if you do. It's, it's so basic, it's so very basic. Uh, and let you find you find people who who file cases and, and they don't have the basis, um, you know. And I think you you read some of the opinions from uh, some of those lawsuits that were brought and you know, opinions by judges who were appointed by Republicans and Democrats, uh, but you know, to a person that the whole problem with the lawsuit was that there was no. No evidence, and if there, you don't have the evidence, you shouldn't make the the allegations. It is again, it's basic, you know, as plain as the nose on your face. It's so very basic. Uh, but you know, what are we to do? Uh, you know, the, the stakes are high. It's the, the things I talked about. There, there are a lot of forces at play. That you know, some a lawyer like that gets up in the morning and decides to do it. Why? Because someone's pressuring him to do it because he thinks maybe he can find the evidence? Who knows? Uh, but the, 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 the more we go on in this, our society, the, the, the motivations for doing it. I mean, it used to be there were, weren't that many motivations for doing it. There wasn't a lot of money at stake. You know, there, you know things were kind of normal back in the 40s and 50s, and, you know, it just an easy life. Now, I mean, I can tell you increasingly, um, as I practice law, um, stakes got higher. We did... Uh, to try to get representations in, uh, in major bankruptcy cases, we would do what's called dog and pony shows. There was competition, um, and you wanted to, to, to get the client and represent the client, and once you got the client, you wanted to perform, and you wanted to show them, you know, you could do it because there was the next time, and they might not pick you the next time. I mean, competition uh, for business these days is intense. And I, you know, I've been away from the profession since 94. It was intense then. And we have lawyers here who can speak to the issue of how intense it is now. There's no client loyalty. You have to prove yourself. Uh, they want to, want to say, you know, cut your fee. And if you don't, they'll go elsewhere. I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of pressure that causes people to do things that they, they probably shouldn't do. Uh, but again, I say, uh, you know, it's the, uh, if, if I do this, then what? If, am I going down a dark path that I shouldn't? And that can be costly. Dollars and cents, reputation, clients, your, your partners in your law firm saying, why did you screw up this representation by not doing this? There's a lot of pressure out there, a lot of pressure, which makes it increasingly difficult. Yes, uh, taking you back to your bankruptcy days, this weekend, we're, we're once again having the 32nd uh, annual bankruptcy conference. 32nd? Recent. Yes. Oh, my goodness. I was there for the <laughs> first through, through ninth, probably. All right. So in a small bar section like bankruptcy, do you find it's much easier to maintain norms because you're really going to be dealing with the same people repeatedly? As I opposed to some of these lawyers in the voting rights cases, whatever, come 
in, and they say it's one and done. They're, yeah. they're into Michigan or Arizona, never to be there again. Yeah. And they're fundraising on the side. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I do think that the fact that the bankruptcy bar uh, was way back when um, you know, a small group of lawyers, and now still is relatively small, and every, people know each other, I think that does make a big difference. Uh, so that respect and that desire for the respect um, is really meaningful. Uh, and I was on the MDL panel um, for seven years, nominated by the, the uh, Chief Justice, uh, and we go around and decide where cases should be centralized. And you would see, you know, the same lawyers. And I think as, well, as large as that group is still, that was a group that knew each other and was going to be working with each other. And if they couldn't take a representation, they'd give it to someone else they respected because they knew that person would reciprocate. And it was a, it was a big body of lawyers, plaintiff's lawyers and defense lawyers, but they did know each other. And I think that mutual respect is really, is really important. I think it's a very good point. Anything else? One up here. Uh, Judge, my name is Harry Oxman. Um, I preceded you by about a dozen years here. Uh, graduating in 1961. But one of the current issues which I find myself uh, having to confront, not with lawyers, but with lay people, is the image of the United States Supreme Court and what it is that exists with reference to uh, ethical rules by which lawyers and judges below the Supreme Court practice. Mm -hmm. If you were um, asked to go ahead and find a way to perhaps clean up the act of the Supreme Court, what would your recommendations be as to how they behave? Well, it's interesting. Um, there are no canons that govern the Supreme Court. There are canons for the other, all the other courts, but not the Supreme Court, which I find that, I'll say I'll find it curious or interesting. Let's just say that. I don't want to be quoted as <laughs> saying that it's necessarily wrong because I haven't studied the, the issue. Um, but I think we all need to be concerned with the integrity of our courts and the, the integrity of the institutions. Um, and what, what one of us does tars all of us. Um, article in the Wall Street Journal, investigation, Wall Street Journal a couple of months ago, of federal judges who it was determined had sat on cases where they or their spouse owned stock in those corporations. Now, I might say as a practical matter, uh, there but for the grace of God, go I. You know, you, you have a stockbroker and perhaps your, your spouse has certain things and the stockbroker makes some trades and, you know, you do or you don't look at it or your, your spouse does or you don't, whatever, and you find, lo and behold, when somebody's done an investigation that you've, you've sat on this case and you, you didn't know it. I, I don't know that there were any where the judge says, yeah, yeah, I owned it, but what of it? I mean, I think most of it was that they didn't know. But, but it, it tarred the whole institution. And there's a move afoot in Congress to really clamp down on this kind of thing and cause like semi-monthly reporting by judges on all their holdings. Now, as it is, we have to file a May 15th every year financial disclosure statement showing every stock transaction by my, myself, spouse, dependent children, every stock transaction. Well, if you have a bunch of stock and you have a stockbroker who <laughs> likes to trade, I mean, it, it's a little bit mind boggling. The first time I had to, to file that financial disclosure, I thought, gee, is this worth being a judge? You know, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's a lot, but it, it causes ripple effect. I mean, they're the, uh, the institution, uh, people are feeling a little bit you know, differently about it. Um, and, and I think, you know, every ethical concern, and as I mentioned to you, that one situation where the lawyer brought up a well, attenuated conflict, if you will, but it was a conflict and I recused. And I have come to the, the um, I always, when in doubt, recuse. It's so much better than risking you know, any censure or, or just, you know, getting up in the morning and saying I shouldn't have. And I think the first time I didn't recuse, I woke up the next morning, I said, wait a minute, no, I'm going to recuse. It's not, it's much more, much more important to do that. Um, so, but, you know, it, the problem is it's a matter of individual judgment. 
recusal the, and the basis for recusal, you know, the appearance of partiality. Well, whose appearance? Who's judging that appearance? It's easy to say, oh, wait, there's no appearance of impartiality. And then you ask somebody else and they say, wait a minute, you can't do that. You know, reasonable minds can differ. So the, the minute you have a debate about whether there's the appearance of impartiality, you, you have one way to go, and that is recuse, because there's, you know, it's, if it's debatable. So uh, that's what I, I always did, and I, I think the, the institution, uh, uh, you know, it's the institution that, that I think you rightly note uh, is at risk. Um, and the Supreme Court these days, you know, there's so much concern about the politicization of the Supreme Court in any event, just by virtue of, you know, the 5-4 nature of the, the opinions. Uh, it's a time when I think we do need to concern, be concerned about the institution as an institution. One last or two last. <laughs> and I'll try to be quick. Judge Rendell, thank you very much for being here today. Uh, my name is Michael Kulik. I'm a 3L. Um, echoing the sentiment of Gabby, I'm curious to know your thoughts and your advice reflecting back on your first few years of practice. Um, I think in light of the pandemic, it's especially uh, enticing for first-year associates and everyone else joining the legal profession this year um, to try and remain in good standing with superiors and to, for lack of a better term, um, go with the flow and make sure all requests are followed. And so I'm curious to know your thoughts on addressing superiors when you're asked to do something that you find unethical um, or that your moral compass tells you may be wrong. Okay. The first thing you do, find a mentor. Find a go-to person who you can talk to and ask them, can I come to you? You know, I'm starting out. I want to do things right. I want to do things for the firm. But I also want to make sure... You know, I'm on solid footing. You know, I've never done this before, and you have. Uh, figure out in the first several months who could be that mentor and uh, see if you could have lunch with him or her. And, uh, and inst I don't say institutionalize it. I had, uh, I was lucky that the first woman partner, I became the second woman partner at Duane, was a woman named Jane Dalton. And uh, when I interviewed at the firm, she had a very busy husband. She had one child, and she was pregnant with her second child. This is 1971. I said, this is the place for me. Jane became my mentor until later I started working with Dave Sykes, probably about four years later. Um, and to that, as an ongoing basis, if I had an issue, it might have been not even an issue of ethics. It might have been an issue of you know, my son's acting out, what do I do? Or just any kind of issue. And I would go to Jane and she would take time. But find that mentor because it's very tough for you to have that look in the mirror. You're not going to know that moral compass. You're not going to know. And the temptation's going to be there to, to do something. I mean, I know a young lawyer back when Jesse was first practicing and he went to work with a firm. And he actually left the firm because the person he was assigned to be with was not ethical was acting in a way, and he had no, he, he left the firm, uh, which sometimes that's the way to go about it. Uh, but you need to be careful. The things you do determine who you are, and if you start out on the wrong footing, it's tough to, it's tough to get back. Uh, so just, I think that's a good question, but, but find a mentor. And maybe it's not in your law firm. Maybe it's, a, and I would encourage you to be involved in your community, to get on a board. Uh, lawyers can contribute so much to uh, nonprofit boards. I've been on probably eight nonprofit boards, uh, not all law related, because it's good for you to expand your horizons. And you'll see people around the table who you'd like, who you admire, and, and they might want to be your mentors too. But find, find a, a mentor. Good afternoon, Judge. Uh, my name's Joe Stanton. I'm a graduate of Temple Law School, 1983. Okay been practicing, you know, coming up on 40 years. Uh, one of the, um, my question is, and, and I don't, if you, if you feel like it, the issue may become, come before you in, in a case, but we now have this speech code for lawyers. And uh, I think it began with the ABA has a, has a rule of professional responsibility. And 
you know, I've done a lot of litigation and it can be tough, it can be very tough. And yes, I agree with the lawyer being in charge of what gets presented and, and the advocacy, but um, to, to have the, these rule, these codes now become part of the professional responsibility. In fact, in Pennsylvania, I believe it's already been done twice, and I believe the district court has struck them down as violating the uh, First Amendment of the lawyer. Um, do, you, do you have any, should lawyers be subject to going back to the cancel culture, I think what the speaker with their questioning was, you know, we all have to be politically correct now, and if you're not, you're you're going to be canceled out. Should this also be pl applied to lawyers and using the rules of professional responsibility yeah. to carry this through? I mean, it's very uncomfortable. Yeah, I mean, you want to be able to go in there and freely say what you feel you should say, yeah. and now, yeah, I think Judge Kenny said this sort of Dam Damocles hanging over the lawyer's head yeah. every time I, an argument I, is made. I think that's one of the toughest areas of the law, whether it's lawyers or not. The, 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 the difference between you know, harassment and, and bullying and hate speech, and I think that area is very difficult. And we saw it a couple decades ago in, in universities. They would um, adopt anti-harassment um, you know, policies, and yet some of them were found, well, wait a minute, we have free speech. When, when does it move from harassment and you know, to, from permissible speech into harassment? And I think for lawyers it has to be very... But I will say this is one of the toughest areas of the law. And uh, I haven't had a case involving that. And thank, I'm just as glad I haven't because I, I think it is really, really uh, difficult. And do we, do we get to kind of a, a tinker standard where you know, it has to be danger is... It, you know, where the speech, you know, the permissible speech ends when there's danger, or is it just permissible speeches? You got to be nice. I mean, I think it's one of the toughest areas of the law. And I think for lawyers, and I really was not aware of these uh, codes, but I think that has to be, I mean, uh, for all the people to, to be able to speak freely, although properly, uh, it, I think it's very difficult for lawyers. But uh, I'm sure cases like that will come up. I just remember the case years and years ago, the University of Penn campus, the Water Buffalo case. Um, a student was um, taken to task, and I think suspended for yelling out the window that someone was a water buffalo, and it was you know, supposedly a racial slur, and I think the whole speech code at Penn was, was, was stricken at the time. I don't know, but, uh, but I think it, it is a close and difficult issue. So. All right, well, thank you all very much. I appreciate it.